American troops have fought battles in more than 40 countries. Some 1,750,000 U.S. soldiers have been killed or wounded fighting in those countries. We like to think of the U.S. as impervious to a foreign invasion. But it has happened. Citizens have been killed as a result, and on more than one occasion, these invasions were kept secret from the American population. Join us now as we go in search of history and discover U.S. invaded. The first time America as a country was invaded by foreign soldiers was during the War of 1812. Most people don't realize how precariously close the United States came to losing what is sometimes called the Second War of Independence. Maybe the United States would have ceased to exist as an independent country and would have been back in the folds of the British Empire. It had been 36 years since the 13 American colonies signed the Declaration of Independence. But Great Britain had little respect for the new nation. America went to war in 1812, mainly as a result of a long history of British blockade, seizures of American ships, seizures of American seamen. And because America, having only recently got independent from England, felt somehow that her republic was in danger of yielding again uh, to British power. God save the United States! Weeks after the war was declared, a British invasion force of 730 Redcoat regulars and 600 Indian warriors from Canada entered the United States. Outnumbered and surprised by the enemy attack, American soldiers at Fort Detroit surrendered without a fight. Up to now, Fort Detroit is the only military post on U.S. soil ever to capitulate to a foreign invader. Uh, Detroit was captured, uh, the British um, came over and burned Buffalo, uh, captured uh, Fort Niagara, the Americans uh, went over the border, uh, burned uh, Fort George, captured Fort Erie and held that for a number of months. So um, uh, there was a lot of action, a lot of battles, back and forth, and a lot of retribution. By 1814, the invasion of the United States was well underway, and many Americans prepared for the worst. When the British were coming south from Montreal uh, in the summer of 1814, uh, they were getting so worried in New York City that they were starting to dig trenches outside the city on Brooklyn Heights. American defenders repelled the British assault aimed at New York. But in August of 1814, a British army smashed through U.S. defenders at Bladensburg, and the unimaginable had happened. The capital of the United States fell into enemy hands. And the British simply swept aside resistance at Bladensburg. One has to think that most of the main troops uh, were occupied on the Canadian border, that uh, you were in Washington, D.C., that they dragged up who they could to resist the British, and it just didn't work. After the British had defeated the American forces at Bladensburg, Maryland, the British entered Washington and burned it. Uh, the fire was so intense uh, from the public buildings burning in Washington, the White House, uh, the Capitol and the Navy Yard, that the soldiers here and the citizens here in Baltimore could see the fiery glow of Washington burning 60 miles away. President James Madison and First Lady Dolly Madison escaped during the confusion of the British attack, taking with them what precious possessions they could quickly carry off, including the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. Now the enemy was in control of the city. It was a very symbolic thing for the British to strike at the heart of the United States and to take the capital of Washington. 
The war raged back and forth, with both sides invading the other's territory and inflicting serious casualties. The British were determined to tip the balance of the war by capturing the strategic port of Baltimore. One of the unusual features of the War of 1812 is that for one of the few times in its history, the Americans found themselves digging trenches, putting up barricades against invasion. The Americans knew they'd have to make a stand at Fort McHenry, which guarded the entrance to the port of Baltimore. Inside the fortification, Major George Armistead and less than a thousand U.S. defenders. Outside, a flotilla of Britain's deadliest ships. Uh, 16 warships firing on the fort here, uh, firing for 25 hours. Major Armistead uh, estimated between 15 and 1,800 bombs, rockets, and shells were fired at the fort, and about four or 500 actually fell within the works or within the, the area. This is one of the British cannonballs that was fired at Fort McHenry in September of 1814. This particular cannonball is hollow on the inside and designed to have gunpowder placed inside of it and plugged with a fuse. The fuse, once it explodes, will create shrapnel, and the shrapnel is designed to kill and injure American soldiers. We know of at least four deaths and 24 wounded um, within the confines of the fort itself. The American defenders realized it was also a war of wits. Before the battle, they had commissioned the making of a huge American flag, which could be seen by the British ships two miles at sea. The morning after the devastating attack, the American flag still flew over the fort, a defiant symbol seen from the British ships, and also seen by a young Baltimore lawyer named Francis Scott Key, who was inspired to write a poem about the incident. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming? Key's poem, originally titled The Defense of Fort McHenry, was published the next day in a local newspaper. In 1931, it officially became the country's national anthem. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. The United States of America had survived its first major military test at the cost of 6,765 casualties. Though the War of 1812 ended by treaty as a stalemate, the American military emerged as a power to be respected. <laughs> Some 30 years later, on May 13, 1846, the U.S. was again invaded, this time by Mexican troops who attacked American soldiers along the Nueces River in Texas. As a result, the United States declared war on Mexico. For 20 years, the U.S. and Mexico had argued over ownership of the Texas territories which were annexed by the United States in 1845. Mexican armies crossed the Rio Grande to reclaim the land, and at least two battles were fought in Texas, and at least 300 Americans were killed. But unlike the War of 1812, most of the fighting took place on Mexican soil. And during two years of fighting, 17,435 U.S. soldiers were killed or wounded. The war ended in 1847, after U.S. forces captured Mexico City. Mexico gave up its claim to what is now California, New Mexico, and Texas. The United States had gained one-third more territory than when the war began. In 1916, American soldiers were training for the possibility they'd be shipped off to war.
So on March 9, 1916, the nation was shocked to hear news of war not from Europe, but from a town in the United States. Well, I was a, approaching four years old. Of course, the sentries were the first ones who uh, were killed, so there was really nothing to warn the town. Foreign soldiers had attacked American citizens as they slept in their homes. Pancho Villa, the Mexican revolutionary, had done the unthinkable, crossed the border with an army of four to 500 soldiers to attack the U.S. town of Columbus, New Mexico. For years, historians have debated over why Pancho Villa would risk the wrath of the United States by such a bold invasion of an American town. Some say it was retaliation for U.S. support given to one of his rivals in the ongoing Mexican Revolution. Others claim it was because an American weapons dealer had cheated him or that Villa simply needed arms and supplies for his troops and knew where to find them. But what is known is the exact moment of Villa's invasion, 4.11 in the morning, a time frozen forever on the clock where the first bullet struck. They had no warning. My grandmother, all of them, were in their robes and nightgowns. The Villistas had a passion for looting. And they looted every store on Broadway Street, which is the main street of the village at that time. And they yanked the lockets off of my uh, grandmother's neck and the rings off of my mother's fingers. One of the first casualties, James T. Dean, an Iowa farmer who had moved his family to the border town to start a new life. He took his final steps while trying to put out a fire at the town store. Well, it was as he was going down Main Street, he got to Broadway, which is the main four corners of town, and uh, that is as far as he got. That's where his body was found with uh, 17 bullet holes in him. American soldiers at nearby Camp Furlong heard the gunfire, and under the cover of darkness, joined the battle in the streets of the little border town. One of the big mistakes that the Vist has made was when they started the fire at the mercantile store. And then it caught the hotel on fire and it lit up the whole area so that the soldiers could see the Vistas to, to shoot them. The invading troops had not counted on coming up against regular U.S. Army soldiers equipped with machine guns and repeating rifles they easily cut down the waves of Villa's attacking army. At daybreak, survivors began to count the dead and take stock of the damage. 19 Americans died that day. A small plaque memorializes their names in the center of town. There were eight U.S. Army soldiers listed and 10 civilians. The one name missing on the monument is that of an unborn child. The only woman that was killed was Bessie James, and she was with child. At sunrise, Villa's marauding army disappeared back into the desert from where it had struck. They took with them stolen supplies, horses, and munitions. But the invaders had paid a heavy price and lost lives. 324. The invasion of Columbus, New Mexico was over in less than three hours. But the terrifying memories of what happened that morning in 1916 have lasted a lifetime. I've lived with it practically every day of my life. We stood looking at the ruins of the, of the hotel. It was still smoldering. I guess it was mattresses and things. And um, they, they were crying, and my grandmother, they all put their arms around one another. And, you know, to a child, I was very struck with, oh, why are they all crying? You know, my, my grandmother, whom I dearly loved. And um, uh, where was the hotel? 
Why were all these horses dead and in the street? I mean, we, this is incomprehensible to a four-year-old. News of the invasion into U.S. territory sent shockwaves across the country, all the way to President Woodrow Wilson in the White House. Uh, as soon as the United States was attacked by a foreign country, which was Mexico, even though it was a revolutionary, President Wilson had the power under emergency power to call up state militias on an international incident, which that was. The city of Columbus posted a reward of $5,000 for Francisco Pancho Villa, dead or alive. But the United States government was prepared to pay a much higher price to avenge the attack on American citizens on American soil. Less than one week after the raid, General John Pershing amassed a force of more than 6,600 soldiers and crossed the border into Mexico to hunt down Pancho Villa. Now, as far as the Americans are concerned, he is simply a, a butcher, and he needs, to be, uh, he needs to be caught, and he needs to be punished. At that time, the Mexican Civil War was underway, and Villa was also being pursued by other Mexican revolutionary forces. Pershing's mission to retaliate for the murders of U.S. citizens was officially named the Punitive Expedition. The American Punitive Expedition, in my judgment, came about primarily because the, this was the American way of saying to Mexico, if you can't control your own borders, we're going to control them for you. The punitive expedition is one of the most unusual military campaigns ever conducted without a declaration of war. It was the first time the United States used airplanes in combat. The first time the U.S. cavalry used mechanized vehicles, including trucks and motorcycles, in war conditions. And there were also some final actions. It's the last time an American soldier went into combat without a helmet. It's the last time an American soldier went into combat without a gas mask. Back in the United States, there was a great deal of interest in the expedition. Newspapers ran daily reports. One headline in Texas even proclaimed, Via slain in bold type. But the report turned out to be false and the stories went back to recounting the chase. For 11 months, Pershing's army searched and Pancho Villa hid. More than a dozen American soldiers lost their lives in skirmishes with Mexican soldiers. the expedition cost the U.S. government an estimated $140 million. But Villa eluded everyone, including bounty hunters and rival factions in the Mexican Civil War. On February 5, 1917, Pershing's army crossed the border back into the United States, never having caught so much as a glimpse of Pancho Villa. Just a few months after their return, many of those same American soldiers, including General Pershing, were shipped off to Europe to fight in World War I. As for Pancho Villa, the only person in the 20th century to lead a military force against U.S. citizens on American soil, he survived 10 years of fighting in the Mexican Revolution and had retired to a huge hacienda to live out his life with his grandchildren. Three years later, in 1923, he was shot to death by political rivals while driving home from a friend's house.
a sleepy little seaside community named Golita, about 60 miles north of Los Angeles. An unlikely target for an enemy attack? Not to the Japanese Imperial Navy in 1942. During World War II, oil wells dotted the California coast. Any Japanese sub commander knew how much damage a direct hit with one of his deck guns could inflict. On February 23, 1942, as the sun went down, the enemy sub surfaced. Along the Pacific coast, the hunt is on for the Jap submarine that brought the war to U.S. soil. Well, at the time, I was 15 years old, and uh, I know I was very scared. We were all very scared. I really got uncontrollably jittery. I suppose it was shock. The Japanese submarine appeared off to the east here. It was a I-17, which is a large uh, ocean-going submarine. It could travel about 6,000 miles without refueling. Lying offshore, the marauder opened up against oil refineries near the beach at Santa Barbara. Rigging and pumping equipment of one plant were shattered by a direct hit. I was working away, and all of a sudden, I heard explosions, bang, bang. Aimed at those storage tanks, deck guns from only a mile offshore missed their mark. And then we heard uh, a, the sound of something shrieking through the sky. There's the crater of a five-incher, nearly big enough to hide that jeep, big enough for all America to see. We've seen the flashes to the west, and uh, my brother and I ran across to Corral and climbed up on the barn, which is equal to a three-story building. And in doing so, we, went, we could see the silhouette of the uh, submarine. We're talking about a two-mile spread between where that flash was taking place and where we were hearing uh, these shells land behind our house. While it moved along the coast here, it fired 26 rounds um, of its five and a half inch gun, which landed all over in the areas. A piece of shell made in Tokyo. It did little harm, but it was the first fired in this war against our own shores. This shell was the only one of the 25, approximately, that were fired that never exploded because it landed in a field of, a newly irrigated field of alfalfa. As far as military invasions go, the submarine attack at Golita was something of a dud. But the attack did hit home the very unnerving fact that Americans were not safe from foreign invasion, even in their own homes. And that was really the target of the Japanese submarine. After we learned about the fact of a Japanese shelling, uh, we were more uh, uh, concerned than we were before, of course. My father handed out uh, deer rifles to all the ranchers up in the canyon to defend ourselves. We really felt we had to defend ourselves from an invasion. The octopus of war embraces the world, war everywhere. In the Atlantic, the Pacific, the China Seas, the Indian Ocean, on all five continents. No American doubts now that this war is our war. We didn't know if any Japanese had come off of the, the submarine or not. Ruth Pratt was home alone with her children that night. Her husband had been away, training with the Civil Defense Home Guard. I was so petrified once the shock set in on me that I saw my, I saw more Jap, Japanese looking in the windows at me that night. <laughs> of course, there was nobody anywhere near me. The Japanese sub had fired 27 rounds. Moments later, it slipped underwater and ran silently into the setting sun but it left a clear message in its wake. It was just to let us know that they, they could come that far. <laughs> a few days later, a broadcast on Radio Tokyo said the following. Sensible Americans know that the submarine shelling of the Pacific coast 
was a warning to the nation that the paradise created by George Washington is on the verge of destruction. Four months later, Japan struck another blow at America's home front and America's self-confidence. This time, a Japanese sub would target Fort Stevens, Oregon. The U.S. Army base was equipped with massive 10-inch cannons designed to guard against an invasion by sea. But the Japanese sub that surfaced near the fort on June 21, 1942, was hidden by the cover of darkness. When the first shell hit, we figured that it was an invasion. That was our first thought in our household. The Japanese, everything was going their way, and they were defeating everything in their path. And people out here on the coast were scared. They really expected, maybe it sounds foolish now, but expected to have an actual attack along our coast. The Japanese submarine fired as many as 17 shells at the fort, and the soldiers inside prepared to return fire. Battery Russell called in a few minutes and said, Battery Russell loaded and ready to fire. I repeated that to the colonel, and he discussed it with the other officers, and he turned back to me and said, Tell them that I order them not to fire. I repeat, you will not fire. I gave this message to the operator, and he, in turn, turned to his officer and told him. And I heard over the phone, who in the hell gave that order? And Colonel Doney was standing close enough to me that he could hear this message. And he told me, gave him the phone, and I did. And he said, this is Colonel Doney. I told you, you will not fire. If you fire one round, I'll court-martial the whole 249th. The commanding officer believed that returning fire at night would only allow the enemy to get an exact fix on the positions of the fort's huge cannons. The decision not to return fire angered many of the soldiers who had been waiting anxiously to fight the enemy. We all wanted to go and engage. I mean, we'd been in intensive training here for a year, year and a half, and here was our chance. There's a lot of anger, and uh, we feel that we should have been able to fire back. By dawn, the submarine was out of sight. The only reminder of the attack, the scattered fragments of the Japanese shells that had exploded harmlessly around the fort. The next day, the men at Fort Stevens put up a makeshift sign challenging their sworn enemy, Japanese Emperor Hirohito, who had once again sent a submarine to test America's home defenses, physical and psychological, against invasion. But Japan was not ready to discard plans to attack Americans at home. In fact, it was in the process of developing an ingenious aerial assault, as we'll discover when In Search of History, U.S. Invaded continues. Elsewhere in the world in 1942, at Bataan in the Philippines, in the greatest defeat ever for the U.S. military, 76,000 servicemen under American command surrendered to the Japanese. At the Battle of Leningrad, troops from the Soviet Union began a major counteroffensive against invading German armies. And in a secret lab at the University of Chicago, Italian physicist Enrico Fermi achieved the first sustained nuclear reaction experiment. Fire, fire, fire. By 1942, the fighting had reached an unparalleled level. Battlefields dotted the world. German U-boats prowled throughout the Atlantic, often moving dangerously close to the American coastline. Anxieties about an impending invasion of mainland USA filled the air. It wasn't all a case of jittery nerves. Along the eastern seaboard in 1942, American bombers attacked more than 50 enemy submarines. In the month of April alone, 
there were six confirmed sinkings of German U-boats within eyesight of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. It's also known now that at one time or another during the war, all 49 of Japan's submarines were sent on missions along the U.S. West Coast. Most of these missions were to gather intelligence. While so much attention was focused on a possible invasion by sea, it's ironic that the most massive enemy attack on American soil came out of the sky. It was one of the most mysterious and unique military bombing assaults in history. It was a fantastic campaign in that it was the first intercontinental bombing mission that was ever, first of all, conceived and then carried out. The top secret plot was known in Japan as Operation Fugo. It was the brainchild of a Japanese engineer named Teruhiko Takeda. His idea was that Japan didn't need airplanes to drop bombs on the United States. Instead, he built giant balloons that could carry bombs more than 6,000 miles from Japan to North America. We think the Japanese planned to build around 15,000. Around 10,000 were actually constructed and approximately 9,300 were launched. We're not sure exactly the numbers. Um, we think about 10% of those made it to the northwest coast of North America. A mechanism made up of connecting barometers, clocks, sand ballast bags, and fuses worked together to have the bombs fall over land after their journey across the Pacific Ocean. What's remarkable about it really is that the Japanese knew a lot more about the jet stream and were able to use it in ways that we had no idea. First of all, we didn't know that the jet stream actually existed. And second of all, the Japanese not only knew that it existed, but they knew how far it went and how fast it went. 32-foot diameter balloons filled with hydrogen gas could rise 38,000 feet up into the jet stream where currents could carry them from Japan to the United States in 65 to 70 hours. At such high altitudes, the balloons were almost impossible to detect before they released their weapons. The Japanese Fugo, or wind ship devices, carried five or six incendiary bombs and one high explosive bomb. The intent was to cause massive forest fires. There was, I think, a kind of myth that uh, America was highly vulnerable to this kind of attack, that uh, because America had these vast forests, uh, if these forests ignited, that they would create havoc, and that they would uh, cause panic in the United States, and that they might somehow affect uh, America's willingness to fight the war. The balloon bombs landed as far north as the Yukon province of Canada and as far south as Mexico. They've been discovered in 26 American states, as far east as Michigan. There are approximately 350 incident reports, which means pieces found in various locations all across North America. The Fugo balloons had a self-destruct device on board, so the few intact mechanisms that survived were due to a malfunction. This is the nose portion of the, uh, one of the 22-pound incendiary bombs that was the main charge of the Japanese bombing balloons. It was the last bomb to be dropped before the self-destruct mechanism went off. American authorities were baffled when fragments of the balloon bomb devices began to be recovered around the country in 1944. It took months to figure out what they were, and then it became a military priority to keep it a secret. The government felt it was important to keep the secret primarily to, first of all, avoid civil panic, and second of all, if the Japanese found out that their weapon was successful, they would send more. The American news media cooperated and never reported incidents of balloon bomb sightings. The country on the receiving end is 
not likely to uh, put out propaganda that these things actually did damage. So uh, Japanese uh, were not told about this on the kind of radio broadcast that went out of the United States uh, dealing with the war. And it wasn't until after the war was over that Japanese actually became aware that some of these had landed and had done some destruction. May 5th, 1945. A preacher and his wife had taken a group of children on a Sunday morning picnic in a park area near Bly, Oregon. While Reverend Archie Mitchell was parking the car, one of the children found an interesting looking metallic object. When someone tried to move it, there was an explosion. The bodies of Mrs. Elise Mitchell and five children ranging in age from 11 to 13 were found along with the fragments of what we now know was one of the Japanese balloon bombs, victims of a war that had seemed so far away, but had really come home. It's amazing that since hundreds of the Fugo balloons reached the United States, there weren't more casualties and more damage. But the Japanese had made one huge mistake in their attempt to set the U.S. afire. When these bombs were being launched, uh, especially in the later phases of the war, uh, many of them in winter, uh, during rainy season, uh, when it was very unlikely that they would have any kind of uh, actual uh, effect in bringing about such fires. The Japanese failure to really understand the vastness of the North American wilderness and also how damp the North American wilderness was and frozen during the winter. Well, if they had launched those uh, balloon bombs in the summertime, uh, it might well, and it had been a dry summer on the West Coast, it might well have had very different consequences. The Japanese balloon bomb campaign, which sent thousands of deadly devices flying over American soil, had no effect on the war. But more than 50 years later, they still pose a very real threat to Americans in the United States. Although there were only 350 or so reported incidents, there are probably still hundreds of these bombs lying in the mountains undiscovered. During World War II, technology made it possible to attack an enemy without ever having to set foot upon its soil a missile launched from a submarine, a balloon bomb floating thousands of miles through the air, and finally, August 6th, 1945. A single bomb dropped over the city of Hiroshima announced to the world that the United States had redefined the term military invasion. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. The atomic age changed the face of warfare forever. The invading enemy could now be completely invisible. Any peace of mind that came with America's nuclear superiority soon evaporated as other nations developed the bomb. The enemy who apparently knows no mercy and who has signified his intention to conquer the world under the banner of communist imperialism. All over the nation, civilian defense crews are alerted to prevent the annihilation of areas vital to our industrial mobilization and our very life. The Russian bear uh, was at any moment going to storm over uh, down through Alaska and Canada and envelop us, and especially here on the West Coast, that was a tremendous fear. Technological advancements in arms and travel have brought the enemy closer. An attack launched half a world away can now land within hours instead of days or weeks, as was once the case. And the enemy is no longer as easy to spot as a soldier in uniform. An attacking agent may even be in the form of a microscopic organism. What's even more insidious about biologicals is that you will not know that you've been attacked. For example, anthrax, you're talking about numbers of deaths ranging from, uh, in, let's say, an attack in New York City from uh, 50 to 100,000 in the low end to a million in the high end. 
the battlefields have changed as well. The lesson of the World Trade Center bombing is that a small group of conspirators with limited capacity using relatively crude materials can achieve an enormous effect. A single terrorist can now cause more devastation than an entire army once could. The targets include crowded office buildings, passenger airliners, even schools and hospitals in any city. If we ask the question, will terrorists bring in the this, this suitcase-sized nuclear weapon, I've I got to say that it's feasible. As the threat of invasion has increased, so have the efforts to combat them. We've got some very good people in the counterterrorism business. Uh, I think our intelligence agencies in this regard are, are excellent. Um, it, it's important, too, that we not let them win by are by adopting methods that sort of close down our society. I mean, they win if, in effect, we are forced to change our basic way of doing business, if we're forced to become a closed rather than an open society, uh, to reduce the, the freedom that we enjoy in order to counter uh, terrorism, then the terrorist is won. Any nation is vulnerable to an outside invasion. But we learn that the human spirit can overcome even the most devastating attacks when we go in search of history.